Welcome to the Lubber's Hole, your Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. And between us, we are wending our way through the Aubrey Maturin stories of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, we're early on in our reading of The Letter of Mark. Can you remind us where we got to last week and where our reading might be taking us this week? Delighted to, Ian. Yeah, last week in chapter one, we joined Jack with his heart sealed off, you know, his kind of way of getting through being struck off the Navy list. And he's he was worried about, you know, mixing these old surprises and all these new privateersmen on the new surprise here. So he's avoiding naval contacts, you know, trying to keep from being slighted and, and also not wanting to hurt his friend's reputation. So he's kind of avoiding any naval people here. Stephen brought Martin aboard as his surgeon's mate, not as a parson for these, <laughs> these superstitious folks on board here. And Stephen and Jack ate dinner with two admirals at the end of the chapter. Admiral Russell told Jack that he, was, he and his friends were working to try to reinstate Jack. And, and Jack realized afterwards, sadly, that they're friends from the wrong political party. Mm. Admiral Shank, on the other hand, talked with Stephen about the danger of balloons. Now, Russell gave Jack a letter written by Lord Nelson. And, and you know, we're all touched by Lord Nelson. Jack yeah. particularly pleased. And they ended the chapter talking about the underhanded tricks of the French. So this time in chapter two, Jack takes the surprise out to exercise the crew, test their gunnery, and works to try to keep them from getting pressed by avoiding his majesty's ships. Now, unfortunately, all those confrontations cannot be altogether avoided but some turn out to be better than others. Now, mm. Stephen has a serious talk with Jack, and they do, among other things, discuss strategy and make plans for the surprise in her crew. And the surprises, Lover's Hole, get some welcome visitors. Yay for visitors to the Lover's Hole. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. So we are rejoining the surprise, and we're at sea. We're on this kind of first tryout voyage for the surprise with her new crew of privateersmen. And Jack is keeping her out of the regular shipping lanes. Like we've already heard, he's very, very nervous of the idea of getting slighted by some bumptious or even sympathetic king's officer. He certainly doesn't like the idea of having his men pressed. And he's very worried about that right now. He doesn't want to be exposed to any personal insults. Uh, the text says the service was not made up solely of men with a great deal of natural or acquired delicacy, and he had already had to put up with some slights. He would get used to them in time, no doubt. But for the present, he was, as it were, flayed. Ooh. Yeah, he had his, had his skin whipped off him. Ugh. Ah. Jack, meanwhile, is having to wear a number of different hats. He's, he's the ship's captain, he's their sailing master, and he's their purser as well. And he's recalling for himself i think just what a boon it had been in his uh, in his blue navy days to have the person with him so he's wading through this great big stack of accounts and invoices and advice notes and bills of lading we join him as it's morning and he's waiting for Stephen to wake up and we know that when he's sound off nothing is going to wake up Stephen. good news familiar news killick is on top of the breakfast situation and believes that the smell of breakfast is going to bring Stephen to life and Stephen has always said English breakfast is England's chief claim to civilization. So that's quite a big, quite a big ask for a breakfast. So just before noon, in fact, Stephen wakes up, he goes on deck and Stephen starts to notice some differences. And Mike, we've heard a lot about Jack's acute perception of the differences between a Royal Navy ship and a letter of Mark. And Stephen is the one who's now noticing the differences. He notices not that they uniforms are different because everybody wears pretty casual rig anyway not because he's missing the man of war pendant at the masthead he's missing the boys the youngsters in the ship's company he's missing the marines scarlet coats and he notices that the presence of the ship's boys had always in the past added this note of joyful cheerfulness however the surprise still has an element of cheerfulness aboard the hands are present and they're talking 
and they're laughing. So maybe it's all going to be okay. Bondin reports that the hands are, in his words, are most uncommon pleased about Lord Nelson's letter. They look upon it as what you might call a sign. So, you know, we see that superstition is still alive and well here oh, yes. in, <laughs> on the crew here. Stephen apologizes for missing breakfast. I slept as the person in Plutarch that ran from Marathon to Athens without a pause would have slept if he had not fallen dead, the creature. Oh, uh, Martin is still sleeping and you know, they're actually Stephen and Martin both worn out because they had run so much yesterday to try to catch the boat. Martin, did, you know, oh, my gosh, it's a job. Stephen like, OK, Martin, I'll, I'll come with you. And Martin helping Stephen along the way there. And Jack is surprised that Martin just didn't go back home. Uh, and Stephen says, well, you know, he wants to tell him about that and about several other things, but in a more private place. So they go down into Jack's cabin and, and Stephen observes that even in Jack's cabin, you know, look at how much has kind of leaked out to the tri- ship here, to the crew. You know, little stays confidential here. The men already know about Lord Nelson's letter. They think they know that the surprise was bought by a syndicate, including Prince William. And Stephen is their mouthpiece. And they're certain they know that Martin, and this is O'Brien's words, has put off his clerical character for that of a surgeon, he having been unfrocked for rogering the bishop's wife, unfrocked and therefore incapable of bringing us bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what they admire most about this supposed character of Martin. Is it the uh, is it the defrocking and the surgeonness, or is it the rogering the bishop's wife? <laughs> nice choice of words there, right? Well, you, know, you might be able to bring us up to speed. Rogering was a new word for me. I, I don't hear it's the uh, side of the pond well, so much. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's a Britishism, or maybe it's me remembering my sniggering schoolboy humor. Rogering, <laughs> rogering is a coarse word for the act of love, and um, it was certainly popular around this time. It gets a big engram bump around the beginning of the 19th century and gets a peak in 2011. I don't know if that's from student humor or if that's from period romance novels. Um, yeah, clearly shagging wasn't a word that was familiar in the Jane Austen era. <sighs> but it's it's great, isn't it, to see that they, they admire, first of all, they admire the Nelson letter. That's one superstitious mark. And first of all, they're very willing to accept Martin and they'll concoct any old story, and even a very unlikely one about Martin's misconduct with the bishop's wife to find a, you know, a, a nice, comfortable, semen-friendly pretext uh, for welcoming him on board. So that that's Roger Ring. There's probably another more serious reference in there. This reference to Plutarch's tale. That was Stephen said that in connection with his and Martin's running across the county of Dorset. What what was Plutarch's tale? What was that all about? Well, it's it's interesting. You know, it, and it's funny that Stephen would pick out Plutarch's version of this. In Plutarch's, you know, he said, you know, th- this runner named by Plutarch. Euclid is is this person who supposedly ran from Marathon to Athens to to tell them about the victory over the Persians and and supposedly kind of the the beginning of the the marathon race. Now I don't want to get on the on the bad side of marathoners everywhere, but interestingly, if you look up these references, there are a number of references all with different names about who the runner was and what they did. Fascinatingly, uh, you know, a lot of people say that that run to Athens may have been made up. However, that that runner, uh, Philippides, who's usually referred to there, in fact, probably pretty clearly ran about 140 miles in two days before that run to Athens to try to entreat the Spartans to come in on the side of Athens against the Persians. So we have this fascinating, historically recorded run, but then we have this perhaps romanticized thing, which gives us our marathon now to have to run there and collapse right as he's told them about the victory over the Persians. Oh, fantastic. And it turns out that the seamen are also willing to believe the fanciful version of the tale about how Nathaniel Martin came aboard. So yeah, it's great. Meanwhile, Mike, we, we've got a little bit of a bit of naval action. It's, it's high time we got some gunnery going on in our lives. Um, gunnery is funnery, as they say, in naval circles. Right. And Pullings, who apparently looked like a terrier who's seen a rat, reports, targets away, sir. Stephen sees that Jack's somberness, this kind of somber mood, has been lifted a bit by the Admiral's kindness and the Nelson's letter. And 
it has returned. He sees his duty, but, says the text, the smell of slow match, the splitting crash of a gun, the screech and twang of its recoil, and the powder smoke eddying along the deck did not really move him now. So Jack's favourite occupation, gunnery, isn't lifting his spirits. And Stephen notices that it's not only him that's taking this in. Stephen notices that Pullings is looking towards Jack with a bit of anxiety. The first half of the gunnery practice doesn't go well. There's nothing remotely like the old surprises record of three accurate broadsides in three minutes and eight seconds, better than any ship in the Navy. This is a a surprise for us, really, because Jack's crews had always been excellent gunners. But then it turns out the old surprises in the gun's crews had been mixed with the new recruits, these privateers, men and ex-smugglers who hadn't had that naval practice, had practiced maybe just in dumb show, running the guns in and out. And Jack has made a decision here to put surprises and Shelmastonians together in gun crews. And right now that combination is not working. They are used to a tradition where powder is expensive. They're used to perhaps also the privateering tradition of not wanting to damage your opponent and reduce your prize money. So therefore, they're more naturally probably inclined to think about boarding. And the old surprises who are used to Jack's ways are worried. And Davidge himself, the lieutenant, turns to Jack, feeling very uneasy to report that the lookout has spotted a very close sail, which tells us that the lookout was watching the practice and not the horizon. So they house their guns, they turn the ship, and a little moment of relief for us. The gunnery wasn't great, but the seamanship here is top draw. The ship turns promptly and beautifully, and they're all set to see if they can outrun whoever this strange sail is on the horizon. Yeah, this this ship is is a Royal Navy cutter, and it has the weather gauge. But you know, surprise could technically outrun her. But you know, Jack's thinking outrunning is going to take us right into the main shipping lines with larger. Navy vessels there. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm going to get stopped by somebody, probably better the cutter who's going to smaller press fewer men than one of you know the big ships that I'm going to run into out there. So Jack orders them to lie to until the cutter comes up. And there's a lot of murmurs from the crew, many of whom, you know, are not looking forward to being pressed for a number of reasons. And one of them actually says to Jack, she's only the viper, sir. Nothing like as swift as us before the wind. And Davidge tells the man to be silent and hits him with his speaking trumpet. Mm -hmm. Now, a little fascinating, um, you know, I think we're contemplating one day doing a little bit of, of, uh, you know, crossing the line in management. Here's here's a Jack management moment. Jack sees this, goes down to his cabin, you know, away from the public, sends for Davidge. And he says, you know, Mr. Davidge, you know, I've told the other officers this, but I don't believe I've told you. And O'Brien writes, there'll be no starting in this ship, no damning of eyes or souls. There's no room for hard horse officers in a private man of war. And Davidge starts to answer back, but he checks himself when he sees Jack's face. O'Brien writes, if there was ever a hard horse officer ready with a frightful blow, regardless of persons, it was Jack Aubrey at this moment. It was a- exactly the wrong thing to get on the wrong side of Jack over, really. That one. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and, and it's fascinating. You, know, you get this thing where um, we, we know Jack's not in a good place when he looks like he's about to hit somebody because he's upset with the fact that they're hitting people. So, <sighs> so Jack, Jack is very conscious of the correct demeanor and the correct management of a naval officer's ego. His own ego is now going to be under trial, I think, because he has to gather his papers up. He has to get dressed in his uniform or his, in, his, in, his, in his smart coat because he's not wearing a uniform anymore right. and go aboard this cutter, the Viper. Stephen comes in just before he's due to go with a paper and tells Jack that he's been wrestling in his mind over whether to show Jack this paper or not. It's meant for the South American voyage, but having heard from the carpenter about what the Viper might be up to, Stephen is afraid (laughs) that this inclination of Jack to hit people might actually come to life in presence of the Viper's commander. So Jack is delighted to see that this document is an exemption from impressment. And I can almost imagine Jack going, "What you showing me this now? Right, like I've been, right. I've been kind of fooling around, hiding in the ocean, keeping out of the way of ships who might press my men. But we had this all along. What, are you kidding me?" <sighs> but it's a it's a really really nice moment. And Jack, who had looked up who the commander was, 
had already pretty quickly reached the conclusion that it might have been hard to avoid kicking this officer if he gave himself airs. So this guy's got a bit of a, a, a reputation for being a bit arrogant. And over on the cutter, indeed, Jack still has a hard time not kicking this arrogant asshole. Um, for the loss of almost all pleasurable emotion left susceptibility, irritation, anger and rage intact or in fact strengthened, except during his long periods of apathy, and this was not one of them. The cutter's commander is bossy, he's rude, he makes Jack wait to be seen when he comes aboard, the midshipmen are staring and whispering and sniggering, and if there's one thing Jack can't stand, it's misconduct from a lazy midshipman taking his ease. The cutter's warrant officers, interestingly, are the ones who watch with silent disapproval. And one middle-aged seaman who had sailed with Jack many years before, it says, stood motionless at the bits with a coil of rope in his hands and a look of positive horror on his face. So finally, the commander of this cutter, Dixon, agrees to see Jack, doesn't offer him a chair. Dixon had been preparing some sarcastic and cutting remarks ever since they'd spotted the surprise. However, faced with Jack's towering form, his very natural air of authority, Dixon chose the smart move to stay quiet even as Jack pushed a few objects off of a locker and sat himself down. And Dixon comes out with his line about, I'm going to have to relieve you of a score of men, 20 hands. And Jack says, with a little bit of satisfaction, I think, they're protected, and he hands over the Admiralty paper. Aubrey Dixon, 15 love, I think. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> so, having come off better there, Jack comes away, Dixon says Jack can go, but that's not the end of the encounter because it wasn't just an encounter between the two commanding officers, Mike. It was a, an encounter between the two crews as well. Yeah, and it, and it goes back to Stephen's point about confidentiality. When Jack walks out, they've overheard all this. Yeah. So Jack's bow crew is smiling and one of the Shelmerstonian men hollers back to the surprise that they're all protected. And Jack's coxswain and the surprises officer of the watch simultaneously call for silence both on you know on jack's boat and on the surprise because all the men are starting to cheer and i, I think jack knows and they all know this could go wrong in a lot of ways we don't want to upset these guys let's just sort of get away clean here so jack gets on board the surprise he goes below and as he's doing so all the shelmerstonian men all these guys who are really worried about being pressed and the old surprise deserters I mean, yeah. these guys who could have been hung, you know, they're all together racing up the weather shrouds, O'Brien writes, facing the cutter. And the yeoman of the sheets calls out one, two, three, and they all bellowed, hoo, 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 and slapped their backsides in unison, laughing like maniacs. Well, Jack hears this, you know, dashes back up and he's, you know, he hollers out, belay there. Goddamn pack of moon calves. Is this a body house? The next man to slap his ass will have it flogged off of Mr. Pullings, the doctor's skiff over the side directly, if you please, and let three more targets be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> I love the choice of word moon calf there, um, because, of course, that was a bit of a it was halfway to being a moon, I would say, at least in in my understanding. I've, I've explored the technicalities of mooning in some depth, as you might imagine, having, you know, been to university right and you know, to a proper moon means bare flesh a new moon on the horizon as you might say but i think they're coming it pretty close not quite so much as the highlanders in braveheart but pretty close and it's meant to be a very very insulting gesture so moon calf i, li I like the word moon um a moon calf in the dictionary also says a foolish person originally a shapeless mass in the womb produced by the influence of the moon but i think there are other associations if you want to dig deep into moon calf as well is that right mike well, it is. It's it's fascinating. You know, I, I was looking at this, too, and it was like moon calf with all these Harry Potter references. I'm going, I don't remember any moon calves in Harry Potter, but it's in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. So a moon calf is a shy, nocturnal creature with smooth, pale gray body, bulging eyes and four spindly legs with large, flat feet. But I don't think that's what Jack meant. That would be more along the doctor's line. <laughs> Very good. Earlier, uh, Stephen had, had suggested to Jack that they climb up in the tops in order to have some privacy in their discussion. And Jack, who had climbed up at the top with Stephen before, said, no, 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 we'll take your skiff out. And we'll get away from the ship. So that's what they're doing now. They're about 200 yards from the surprise. And Jack, again, thanks Stephen for the letter and, you know, about how it saved the lives of their old shipmates who had deserted to join, how 
you know, all these Silverstonians were at risk here. And now he doesn't have to play hide and seek with a king's ship going oh. forward, exactly as you said. Yeah. So Jack knows that he can't ask Stephen how he got it. And, and he says that. And Stephen says, yeah, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Because he says, Jack is as silent as the tomb where discretion is required. And so Stephen tells him that on this voyage that they're going to make to South America, the Admiralty knows that Stephen is making some discreet contacts on behalf of government. And the Admiralty and government both know that surprise can't get to South America if it's stripped of its hands. So that's why they've gotten this letter for that voyage here. And now that they're out and confidential, Stephen has some more things that he wants to share with Jack. Ian, what's he been holding back here? What's well, he's been holding back pretty much the entire last three chapters of the reverse of the medal. <laughs> so we get a bit of really nice reverse exposition in Stephen's first person speech to Jack, telling him about the stock exchange fraud, about the role of Palmer, about um, the implication of Andrew Ray. He tells that Jack the story of Duhamel returning the Blue Peter and the trap that was laid or almost successfully laid for Ray and Ledwood. We also learn that this intelligence from Ray and Ledwood had involved knowledge of English military and naval movements and English relations with the Swedish court. And Mike, I, I don't know why we mentioned the Swedish court here, except to say that we're going to hear more about Sweden later on in this book. Right. And we learned that we hadn't quite kind of consummated this whole um, entrapment of Ledwood and Ray. They'd got away a search of their homes had implicated Ray in the stock exchange fraud and shown that he had profited from it, but it hadn't been the complete coup in terms of capturing and incriminating Ray and Ledwood. All of Stephen's colleagues, we learn, who never thought you could have been anything more than indiscreet with those vile stocks and shares, are now wholly convinced of your innocence. And Mike, this is potentially game-changing news for Jack, right? Yeah. And I, I think he's doing everything he can not to say anything as Stephen is telling this. And, you know, Brian tells us his heart is beating faster and stronger. He's breathing and, and he tries. He really works hard to control his voice's pitch when he asks, does that mean I may be reinstated? You know, and he's just like, this is like everything on his mind now. This is it. And, and Stephen, as a true friend, replies honestly. If there were any justice in the world, I'm sure it would, my dear. But you must not look for it with any kind of certainty, never with any kind of strong hope at all. And he's saying, you know, at present, Ray and Ledward, they're gone. They can't be brought to trial. And the way they've disappeared suggests that perhaps there's somebody even higher in the ministry and government protecting them. Things are kind of being slow walked in terms of their chase here. And the ministry clearly does not want this scandal blowing back on them because they had obviously launched this thing. They're already getting enough out of Jack being in the pillory here. And now, you know, they're going to let the, the radicals off and everything. So they wouldn't do that just to save any innocent man, and especially one that has, as Jack does, the liability of his father. So Stephen ends by saying, on the other hand, I believe a friend would advise you not to despair. Above all, not to give way to melancholy. Be not idle. Be not alone, as dear Burton says, for activity, naval activity, is the solution, if solution there be. Mike, uh, this name of Burton is dropped in there in the way that O'Brien often drops in things when there's loads and loads of connections to explore. What do we really know about this person? called Burton. Well, interestingly, Robert Burton, 1577 to 1640, English clergyman, Anglican, and a scholar, you know, pretty much in Oxford, in, in residence at Oxford the whole time. And pretty much, I mean, he, he wrote many things, did many things, but his life's work, uh, which came out in about six different editions, was this entire treatise about melancholy. And this Burton suffered from melancholy. And, and it said later, you know, I write of melancholy by being busy to avoid melancholy. There's no greater cause of melancholy than idleness, no better cure than business. So Burton basically assembles everything he can find from ancient sources, from contemporary sources, from medicine, philosophy, theology, 
you know, conventional wisdom, anything about melancholy, depression, and, and including that line, the line that Stephen quoted, which is really at the end of 500,000 words, the way he sums it up, be not solitary, be not idle. Mike, this this rang a little bit of a bell with me. I think we've heard this advice given um, from Stephen to Jack before. And way back in the fortune of war, in the first chapter, um, Stephen and Jack are in the Far East waiting for the chance to get a journey home to sort things out. And Stephen at that time gives the advice. He says, I speak in all gravity, brother. Be not idle. Be not alone. So this is where that came from. Nice. It is. Well, and, and it's funny because this treatise um, sold incredibly in its time. I mean, its publisher put together an incredible estate based on his profits of this thing. And then it kind of got forgotten for a long time. And then later it gets picked up again. Dr. Johnson, Samuel Johnson said uh, of this book, it's the only book that ever took me out of bed two hours sooner than I wished to rise. So <laughs> yeah, it, it, it gets kind of, you know, disappears and then gets revived again. It clearly you know, stuck in O'Brien's mind. Yeah. Interestingly, a lot of the depression research nowadays would confirm that this is probably the best advice. Yeah. Be not idle. Be not alone. Be not doom scrolling on social media, I think is how I would wind up for the 21st century. There you go. You know, try, try that first in a little exercise before the drugs. <laughs> So it's it's really great advice from Stephen to Jack. We have to wait and see as to how far he's going to take it. Jack goes on now to tell Stephen about this very realistic dream he'd had the night before, that the trial, the whole affair, had never happened. And Jack describes having woken up and looked confidently for his old uniform coat. And he says his reason acquiesced in everything Stephen had said, but in his irrational part, a very small glow was dissipating the most extreme unhappiness and he knows now that others think him innocent he knows that perhaps there's some way that out some evidence out there that might prove his innocence he's uh, permitted to think that possibly he might get reinstated one day and that all ought to be a partial cure for melancholy but this uh, I, I was really struck mike by this idea of him, him waking up and looking for his uniform coat and seeing him not there that sounded like a real pang of grief for Jack, you know, like waking up and realizing that a that, that a loved one or a partner is not there, and it's a real uh, heart sink moment. Yeah, I wonder yeah. then. I wonder then back, back to this idea of uh, the beginning of this book. I think is all about Jack deciding is he gonna is he gonna stay with melancholy or is he gonna find some way to restore his own fortunes from within? And here's the choice presented before Jack: is he gonna dwell on the grief of the symbolism of his uniform coat not being there, or is he going to take Stephen's advice? and throw himself into naval activity. Well, let's see. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm right with you. I am right with you, Ian. So you know, they've, they've, they've gone through this moment now, and, and Jack remembers back to this story that Stevens just told him about, you know, getting all this information and where it comes from. And, and he says, you know, he really likes Duhamel, and, and he's glad that Stephen got to see him again. You know, he's such a good man. Stephen responds to Jack, says, he was a good man. And restoring this diamond when he was cutting all ties with his country, going to Canada was as striking an example of liberal behavior as I can recall. I regret him much. Jack says, he's not dead, poor fellow. And Stephen replies, I should not have mentioned his name if he had been living. You know, Stephen, who's got this, you know, spies confidence around him. And Stephen explains that, you know, Hennage Dundas was to carry Duhamel to Canada Duhamel had converted all his assets to gold, stored them in a big belt around his waist, and that going on board Hennage's ship in a turbulent sea, he slipped between the boat and the sea, just as Stephen says, the way I often do. You know? And his fortune sunk him without the least hope of recovery. Oh, my gosh. You know, mm. It's kind of disconcerting the way that O'Brien just kind of gives us this in this just brief thing here. Oh, and yeah, once again, the, the death of an important character just just dropped into conversation, all, almost hadn't been mentioned. I think I, I, I was really sorry about this. I, I was liking the idea 
of Duhamel as a like a counter protagonist to Stephen, you know, like uh, Carla and George Smiley in the John le Carre books. That there's an, another spy master somewhere else in the shadowy world that we can keep coming back to from time to time. And I really wondered, like, why kill Duhamel at this point? Uh, listener Rob Hammett got in touch on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash lubbers hole. Um, could also have used Twitter at whole lubbers if you want to find us on Twitter. But Rob said he'd always been suspicious of Duhamel's fate. Rob Hammett writes, given how closely the gentlemen read the books, I'd love to know their thoughts. He's talking about us. Was it truly an accident or did either a French or even an English service have a hand in it? Stephen and Dundas both seem innocent enough, but you can never tell. Um, Rob, I, it's a really interesting thought. I think that the description of the accident is so clearly accidental and there's there's nobody else remotely under suspicion on the scene. That side of me believes that it was truly an accident. But the side of me that cares about having interesting characters in the story is really puzzled as to why we lose Duhamel, which had such great character potential. Uh, maybe it's just a way to add jeopardy for Stephen and indirectly mm. for Joseph Blaine. Uh, maybe it's the chance to give this line about someone whose fortune sank him without the least hope of recovery when we've been hearing in the earlier chapters just how wealthy Stephen is right now. I don't know. It's a mystery. Um, if anybody else has got any thoughts, do Hamill. Did he sink or was he sunk? <laughs> Let us know. By all means. And, and Ian, talking about how our fortune you know, kind of sinks us, Stephen had mentioned in telling Jack all about this that Duhamel had returned the Blue Peter and they discussed, you know, Diana's diamond and all that. And now that, you know, Jack says that he's really sorry about losing Duhamel and and he thinks to himself how much he wants to talk to Stephen about yeah. Diana and the diamond. You know, Jack O'Brien writes, you know, thinks it seemed inhuman not to do so, but he decided that the matter was altogether too delicate. He might easily be laid by the lee. He might easily give pain and silence was better until Stephen should mention her again. So, gosh, this whole, you know, these moments here where Jack just had this, you know, hey, I, 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 I can see a way out of this. Duhamel's dead. Stephen's got this diamond. It's like, ah, it's very, and, and Jack's dream in the midst of all that as well. Oh, so mm. the, n- nobody is emotionally out of the woods here at all. In fact, so you might say emotionally they're they're headed deeper and deeper into the forest here. Uh, let, let's turn back for a moment to, to review how the gunnery has been going. Um, Good. They row back to the ship. The larboard watch, we learn, has had a slightly better performance with the guns. Unlike the earlier one, this was accompanied by a running fire of criticism, advice, and even praise from the quarter deck. So that's quite promising. Mm-hmm. And then they indulge themselves in two more rippling broadsides from close range and rippling because we know that a, a solid altogether broadside would actually wreck surprises planking because she's so old. The crew, it turns out, are viewing this whole thing as a celebration of their triumph over the Viper, their moral triumph. And in the finale of this whole thing, Jack and the gunner themselves each fire one of those long brass nine pounder bow chasers, Jack's private property. And there's a great big cheer. But we're still not, I think, completely on the side of happiness. Martin has noticed the temperature of the emotions on board and turns to Stephen and says, surely the captain is looking more himself. Do you not think? Yesterday evening, I was extremely shocked. So, Mike, maybe, maybe we all want to go and reflect on how our gunnery is working out. Maybe we all want to take a little row around a ship. Maybe we also want to join in the celebration of Jack's little victory over the Viper. It could be time for a short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lubbers hole. Well, welcome back from the break. Perhaps some of you were thinking, well, what about Jack? Doing a bit better now? Not doing better? O'Brien tells us that the extreme edge of Jack's unhappiness is gone, but that there's still plenty of worry and anxiety about his domestic and legal complications and the near impossibility of recruiting a ship's company of much the same quality throughout. So I, I... I think this is kind of a positive sign. So yeah. we've got all these big things on Jack's mind, but the thing that right now is gripping him 
is I'm a little worried about how my crew's coming together here. So this is this is good after getting involved in that gunnery again. Well, he realizes that these new recruits, they've just had a few practices and the old surprises had 10 years of working in the same gun crew. So he's never going to get them to that level again, that that old surprise record setting level. And he thinks, well, you know, I could change strategy. I could just, you know, go straight at him. Nelson's old advice. But but that means kind of, you know, 20 minutes or so of just taking on fire as you try to get close to that prey. And, you know, who knows whether we'll even get there or not. Could do a lot of damage. So he also remembers to himself that, wait a minute, you know, the strategy that I developed over the years, this thing I'm trying to instill in them about gunnery, that was all part of taking, sinking, burning, destroying the enemy's national ships of war. But but now I'm going to be going after merchantmen, and that's prey that's better left undamaged if possible. And, and Jack, you know, pauses for a moment. He's thinking, you know, he loves that glory of engaging an enemy ship of equal size. But then, as O'Brien writes, surprise, though fast and weatherly, we remember those words coming out of Jack Aubrey's mouth in the movie, Belong to a former age as far as glory was concerned. Yeah. And and the reason is that, you know, she's a frigate. And so there's no glory if she captures anything smaller than a frigate. But all the frigates nowadays, as, as O'Brien has reminded us several times, are much larger, more powerful, you know, much heavier weight of metal and gunnery and a lot more people in terms of boarding or repelling borders here. And so Jack thinks, well, you know, maybe we'll go back to Karen age. They're, they're not accurate, very accurate. They're certainly not for long range, but they don't require a great skill in handling. And while they could fire a 32 pound ball, a big smasher, they could also be loaded with case shot to cut up an enemy's rigging or clear her decks of men waiting to board. And, I love this line. So Jack's thinking to himself, hmm, counting 400 shot to a canister with a broadside of 14 carronades, that came to more than 4,000 and 4,000 iron balls screaming across the deck at 1,674 feet a second had a discouraging effect, even if they were fired by inexpert hands. So here is Jack going, yeah, I think I can get this crew with Karen H to, you know, have quite the impact here. Now, Jack knows he's going to miss this ship to ship action, the maneuvering, firing long guns accurately at far range, and then, you know, kind of increasing the fire as they get closer and closer till they're yard arm to yard arm in a cloud of smoke. But he knows he needs to do something different. Yeah. And he's thinking about things differently, and he then gets to have a conversation that he wouldn't normally have had in his life as a king's officer. He talks to one of his shipmates about strategy, and of course, he's talking to Stephen. Stephen is surprised his owner, actually, so maybe that's appropriate anyhow. Um, Stephen is very happy to say that his opinion's not worth very much, since he's usually below the waterline during battle. He suggests that Jack could have his cake and eat it too, which, by the way, is a perfectly straightforward rendering of the saying, and Jack would have mangled it and probably said, you can, <laughs> you can have your cake and put two birds in the bush at the same time. Anyhow, Stephen says, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can train the new crews, get the crews mixing to make a happy ship, um, do that on the long guns to start with, and if it doesn't answer, change over to the carronades. And he also points out to Jack that, like, feel free to burn as much gunpowder as you like because we have plenty. Um, don't worry about trying to save the venture money. Let's get ourselves into, into good shape to fight. And he reminds Jack that he, Jack, had brought private powder out of his own private resources in the past. So it's not really so different. And he'll be happy to see more powder used, especially since he reminds Jack that they already have surprises old carronades in the hold. Tom Pullings had pulled some fancy footwork at the auction at the yard. He'd managed to secure the carronades as well by treating them as ballast and putting them down in the hold. So it turns out that these carronades are available on the ship at no extra cost. So smart work by Pullings, smart work, I think, by Stephen as well to point Jack towards this opportunity for a change in tactics. Jack, you know, while he's talking to Stephen, and, and I think he's kind of in his mind thinking, you know, I got to give the owner his due a little bit. He wants to talk about punishment on a private man of war. And he's telling Stephen that many of these ships let the men decide punishment. And and Stephen chimes in and says, well, 
I, I would think that they're not going to be very hard on their shipmates. But Jack points out that in the mutinies, when the men were running their own ships and they kind of let themselves decide, they were actually stricter, often, you know, rigging the grading for anything they considered misconduct. And, and Jack's worried that if there is ever bad blood between the old hands and the new hands, they might take it out in punishment for each other. And the surprises, the old surprises are the minority on the ship here. And, and Jack is certainly not going to have any of his old, you know, Jack doesn't like floggings to begin with, but he's definitely not going to have any of his men flogged like that out of no. spite, out of some kind of rivalry here. So Stephen says, let us hope that the constant firing of the great guns will bring them better friends. I've often observed that extremely violent noise and activity go with good fellowship and heightened spirits. <laughs> I, I I just love that line here. And, and I'm reminded, you know, years ago, my buddy Frank used to call me up from time to time and say, you know, I think it's really time we go see an ordinance movie, you know, something that features a lot of things getting blown up. It was definitely good fellowship and heightened spirits. Yeah, it's it's no coincidence, I think, that Die Hard Probably the one of the one of the best and original ordinance movies came out in the holiday season. Like that absolutely lifts your spirits. Oh. I, I like as well here, Mike, how in this conflict between Jack dwelling on melancholy and Jack getting into naval activity, he is maybe even despite himself, he's getting drawn into the practicalities. He's getting drawn into these conversations about gunnery and tactics and carronades. And he's got new problems to solve about manning and about discipline. He almost can't help getting drawn into solving the problems that the surprise now has in her new job as, as, a, as a letter of mark, as a private man of war. Absolutely. I think, you know, Navy or no Navy, this is who Jack is. Yeah. You know, and I love that. <laughs> now, Jack takes Stephen at his word. And of course, there is indeed plenty of extremely violent noise and activity with all this gunnery practice. And Mike, I'm I'm reminded of a scene from the Master and Commander movie here where we get Stephen below with kind of wads of cotton in his ears. Martin and Stephen really don't like this. They go, they don't like how it interferes with their naturalizing, scares all the birds and the fishes away. However, we notice that it does do Stephen's heart good to see Jack hurrying from gun to gun in the smoke, sometimes violently lit by the great stabs of flame, sometimes a tall wraith advising the crews in a steady, wholly competent roar, shoving the awkward hands into the right position, sometimes clapping onto a side tackle to run the gun up, sometimes heaving on a crow to point it, always with the same eager, intense concentration and a look of grave satisfaction when the shot went home and the gun crew cheered. And we get this lovely account of how they're, this is going well, the guns are getting so hot that they jump, Jumping Billy, one of those famously named guns that we actually see in the opening sequence of Master and Commander, had broken free. And Mike, this terrible incident now happens that turns out is going to have some important consequences for this book and are quite a long way into the future. Yeah. So, you know, this thing would have run them up on deck. They're kind of in a big swell and the thing, you know, could do some real damage, but Patty catches it with a hand spike. But while the rest of the crew is trying to secure it, He's got his hand pressed against the hot gun and his skin comes off. His blood is hissing on the metal and Stephen treats him with what O'Brien calls a heroic dose of laudanum. And so we've got, you know, Patty and kind of floating away in this opium kind of trance as, as Stephen is just telling Martin, this is, this is like your panacea. This is what you need in your medicine box all the time. And you know, he goes on to tell him, all the wonderful things that he treats with it. He doesn't happen to mention heartache, which is, I think, one of the things Stephen is treating most yeah. often right now with his laudanum. And and Martin asks almost, you know, I think Martin's a little kind of taken aback, but he says, well, aren't there some objections to opium eating because it becomes habitual? And, and Stephen replies, these objections come only from a few unhappy beings, Jasonists for the most part, who also condemn wine, agreeable food, music, the company of women. They even call out against coffee for all love. Their objections are valid solely in the case of a few poor souls with feeble willpower who would just as easily become victims of intoxicating liquors, who are practically moral imbeciles, often addicted to other forms of depravity. Otherwise, it's no more injurious than smoking tobacco. And <laughs> Boy, there's so much wrapped 
up in that. You know, spoken like a true smoker and addict, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. Oh gosh. And he's also being kind towards Padine. And this is yeah. this is the beginning of a really quite tragic story arc, which is going to have, to use the phrase from the cinephiles, this is a plant that has some payoffs that come later. Padine is being treated with laudanum mercifully and kindly by Stephen to help with the terrible pain of this burn. That's going to have some consequences in this book and some consequences way many, many books ahead. Uh, I don't want to give too much away in terms of spoilers, but let's just say that this moment of kind care for Padine is going to cost Stephen a nasty tumble later on in this book. Ah, uh, so Mike, we 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 kind of strolled right past this reference to Jasonists or J- Jan- Jansenists. What's what's going on there? Is there some other sect that that we should care about? Well, yeah, it, I you know I, I I chase this down a little bit, thinking you know usually O'Brien. There's some reason he's putting it in here, and it and it could have been just for the face reason that you know these are people who are against everything. But boy, it is a it's a theological rabbit hole, you know, all the minutia of splits and things and what's going on here. As as one source said, you know, this was a, a theological movement within Catholicism, primarily active in France, that emphasized original sin, human depravity, the necessity of divine grace and predestination, almost kind of a Catholic Calvinists crossbreed with a few other semi-heretical points thrown in here. But I will say that having done this long chase, the theological differences are not germane to Stephen's point. I think they, <laughs> we could have just as easily said Southern Baptists. That's- okay. <laughs> so we, we stepped neatly past that rabbit hole. Well, I'm sure we'll find another one to fall into. Right. Oh, fantastic. So Stephen and Martin then go on deck and they see Jack and Pullings in the main top. Mike, this this is a journey up into the main top that's going to have some resonances, I think, for you and me and maybe for our listeners. Stephen suggests that this would be a great moment to go ahead and climb the rigging. And some old surprises who know what's going on here um, run after them and help them out and tell Stephen where to place his feet. And Surprise has got a 36-gun ship's mainmast, i.e. a tall mainmast. And they've watched Stephen climb in the past, and they have they have you know, fine feelings of fellowship towards Stephen and they know the risks that he's taking on with his lack of skill. Presently, we learn, two delighted faces gazed into the top through the lubber's hole. Yay for the lubber's hole. Do nothing rash, cried Aubrey. You have not come by your sea legs yet. This is no time for skylarking. Give me your hand. He heaved Stephen and then Martin up onto the platform and once again Stephen wandered at his strength. Stephen's bare nine stone was perhaps natural enough, but Martin was far more stoutly built. For all that, he was swung up with a lift as effortless as though he had been a moderate dog, held by the nape, swung right up through the hole, and sat down on his feet. Ah, Mike, there, there, there should be a little lubber's hole set piece in every one of these books. I'm sure somebody can look into that. Absolutely. And Jack swinging up dogs, always a nice uh, take us back reference. <laughs> yeah, it takes us back to Ponto and Trees and Harbour. Right. Jack and Pullings are there, you know, looking closely through telescopes. Martin, you know, when he saw them originally, thought they were looking at a Caspian tern, that uh, a bird that Pullings had mentioned the day before. But clearly they're not. You know, they're looking at a sail that's getting close by. And Pullings very discontentedly says, what airs these eight? Teen gun sloops do give themselves to be sure. Look at how she's cracking on. It'll be Moonrakers next. I'll lay half a crown. She carries away that four top gallon studding sail in the next five minutes. And, you know, he gives Martin his telescope and Martin sees her fire a gun and he wonders, you know, is she going to have the confidence to attack them? And, and Jack says, no, 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 that's, you know, it's one of our ships. And the shot is telling the surprise to lie too. Stephen says, well, you know, he's kind of seems worried that another encounter like they had with the Viper. And he's saying, you know, maybe we should feign deafness and sail off. And, and Jack had thought about that same thing. But he saw that this ship that was approaching them had responded so quickly when she saw surprise that Jack was sure she recognized her. And, you know, probably because of this uncommon main masking that you just mentioned. And Jack's saying to Pooling, you know, maybe when we're out cruising... We should we should substitute our regular main mass so uh, you know people can't spot us so easily. But he knows that if they've been recognized and they run when told to lie too, 
that'll cost them their letter of mark. Yeah. So, Ian, Moonraker. So I'm thinking James Bond, Moonraker. No, 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 I don't think so. What? Oh, it would be great, wouldn't it? Um, a Moonraker is uh, also known sometimes as a moon sail or hope in heaven or a hope sail is a square sail flown immediately above a sky sail. So it's above, above a top gallant. The equivalent sail, if it's triangular, is called a skyscraper, but a moonraker is a little square scrap of sail right at the very top of the rig. Relatively unusual, really only able to be rigged or chosen to be rigged on ships that are built for speed because it's a right effort to get the get the, the spar and the sail all the way up that high and rigged and trimmed. Wow. We learn that uh, this is a sail that a particular co-protagonist of jacks likes to use and i thought tartarus tartarus hold on that's the name of the ship that ought to ring a bell and pretty soon we get reminded of who commands the tartarus it's our old friend babington so jack says to west let's close with her babington sends up a signal which tom reads with a little bit of difficulty welcome repeat welcome happy sea beg captain sup have message hope now he's telegraphing, and he's obviously telegraphing something by by letter. P H I Z. Huh. The signal mid can't spell. And a yeoman below tells a Shemlestonian, Fizz, Fizz means our doctor, which he's not a common two pence ago barber surgeon, but a genuine certified physician with a bob wig and a gold headed cane, which is the, the stock phrase that we know that the hands used to describe Stephen. The boats come close, allowing for the growing sea, and Babington whose boat low is easier, offers to come and pick up the guests because it's going to be time for some socialising. Jack, even so, is inclined to keep the visit short because he sees that the weather's turning nasty. But Jack has Pullings and Stephen, who are King's officers, go up the side first. So Jack is letting them take precedence because he's not a commissioned officer. Mm -hmm. And Mowat meets them on deck. Babington is carrying Mowat to his new ship, Illustrious, in Gibraltar. And in the cabin, they meet... Fanny Hart, also known as Mrs. Andrew Ray. You might all remember that Babington and, by implication, his sweetheart Fanny had been asking Jack and Stephen's advice about whether they should elope and uh, Fanny should run away from Andrew Ray. It turns out that that might now be in play. Fanny is worried then what they're all going to think of her sailing with Babington, especially Captain Aubrey after all he's been through and she's aware of Jack's strong feelings on the subject of women aboard ships. Um, Stephen assures her that Jack has always liked her personally. He's never one to throw stones. I'm not entirely sure that that's true. But anyway, Stephen mm. says Jack is never one to throw stones. And he asks why Fanny had called William Babington Charles the last time that he'd seen her. And he learns that they'd been to a masked ball. She had been dressed as a sheep, which brings all kinds of hilarious images to mind. And he had been dressed as bonnie prince charlie uh the young pretender and he was so cute in a kilt she says that she called him charlie for days oh call me charlie um fanny hopes that the pudding that they have um preparing here which is being cooked quickly in something called a papin's digester is going to be ready in time for captain aubrey and she remembers that puddings take hours to cook and mike th th this digester this is a real thing for helping puddings cook more quickly is that right not a real thing for puddings, per se. It's it's actually a steam digester. It was invented by a French physicist, Dennis Papin, in 1679. And it was actually made to extract fat from bones, a real high-pressure steam environment. And it also renders the bones brittle enough so they can be ground into bone meal. Hmm. You know, nowadays we've got kind of pressure cookers. So this was kind of the, the, the great, great, great grandfather or mother of those and it had a special steam-released valve, which uh, you know was invented for this digester by Papin. And it actually inspires the development of the piston and cylinder steam engine, which which comes to follow. So, real thing, real in the time. You know, uh, well done, O'Brien here. But but a fascinating thing to put in here. So while this pudding is being cooked, hopefully at rapid speed in this digester, the company all sit down to dinner together. Supper is filled with talk and with laughter. They have much better food than their surprise because currently there's no captain or gunroom cook aboard the surprise and everyone's living on ship's provisions. Babington has told them this story about chasing a swift sailing American schooner trying to run the blockade at Brest or Lorient. 
And Babington reports having used light hawsers to the mastheads, just like Jack would normally do. And he'd almost had her after two days when his main and four topsails blew out of their bolt ropes at the same time. So they lost her, but they had succeeded in pushing this schooner several hundred miles further south. And we kind of leave that part of the conversation for a moment and we turn to a conversation about publication. Mowat tells Stephen that his publishers keep procrastinating. They're delaying the release of his book of poetry. This has allowed him to write one more poem to add to the volume, which he is now prevailed upon to recite. Since it's long, he says, um, he's going to go to the end verses that show the carnage of battle. In the poem, the squadrons are getting closer. And as this is all building up, we hear a crash, like a 12-pounder firing from somewhere forward. And Setting that to one side for a minute, Moet continues his recitation. Death, he says, death strides from ship to ship with sweeping scythe. On every poop damned fiends of murder writhe. Demons of carnage ride the empurpled flood, champ their fell jaws and quaff the streaming blood. Like this is this is pretty pretty rich stuff. Whoa. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure Fanny's gonna be delighted that she asked to hear it at this point here. Oh. And, so as as Moet is in this point of the poem, a midshipman runs in and reports that this digesting machine, this pressure cooker, has burst. You know, Babington goes out to to check on it. He returns and reports that no one is dead, but they're scalded, and, and the pudding is kind of equally spread out over the cook, his mates, and a deckhand that happened to be in there. Um, they had decided that maybe if they put a smoothing iron over the safety valve it would cook faster. So they hadn't let any of the steam escape and it blew up. Ah. So uh, we have this really comic turn now of ha having been talking kind of seriously dramatically about death and disaster in Moet's poetry. We've got this really hilarious uh, situation with the, with the exploding digester. Um, so back on board the surprise, Jack is regretful that he's missed out on the pudding um, and he reflects on Fanny and William and he says, although Fanny Hart may be neither Scylla nor Charybdis, they are very, very fond of one another. And when is all is said and done, that is what really signifies. And Mike, I think if this had been Stephen Maturin talking about Scylla and Charybdis, you might want to dig into the identity of Scylla and Charybdis and plot what that might mean for Fanny Hart. Because um, in Greek mythology, Scylla was a six-headed monster who lived in a rock on one side of a narrow strait. Charybdis was the name of the whirlpool on the other side of the strait. And both are threats to passing sailors who might pass close to Scylla's rock in order to avoid Charybdis. So this saying of being between Scylla and Charybdis is a synonym for being between, as they say, a rock and a hard place. So this doesn't paint a very appealing picture of the role or the persona of Fanny Hart, does it? Right, right. You know, that, that she's, you know she's not a rock and she's not a hard place. But yeah. they're fond of each other. And you're kind of wondering, what, what does Jack mean here? I think you're right, Ian. I think he's, he's just kind of mangled a bit of a classical reference. But I, I do like his thought that, you know, their fondness for one another is is what signifies there. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure it is tough. I, You know, maybe the two of them each feel individually. William, I, you know, it's hard to be without her. It's also hard to be with her. Um, for Fanny, certainly she can't be with Ray, but she's wondering, you know, what do people think of her when she's with William and sailing with him while she's married? You know, so it, it could be tough for both of them, but I'm, I'm really having a hard time kind of getting at exactly what Jack meant by that until, as you say, well, it's Jack delivering it, not Stephen here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So meanwhile, Jack is pleased to hear that Babington had stopped by Ashgrove Cottage. He's brought a letter from Sophie and all seems to be well. Um, Mrs. Williams is being unusually supportive, um, perhaps because she feels uh, she she would have rigged the market to protect her capital as well. Yeah, yeah. No no thought about Jack being innocent and I'm supporting him. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm glad he did it. I would have done the same thing. <laughs> And we get this really a, a final extra turn of optimism in the chapter here. We started to feel optimistic as Jack's getting heavily into the seagoing affairs of the surprise and the manning and the and the tactics and stuff. Jack hears Stephen picking out a tune on the cello as they talk, and he thinks it's the Marseillaise. Stephen says it is not. It is, or it is rather meant to be, the Mozart piece that was no doubt lurking somewhere in the Frenchman's mind when he wrote it. 
I might, I just, let's just pause here for a second. It could well be. This is a nice piece of musical detectivism by Patrick O'Brien. The, the Marseillaise, the French national anthem, um, was to a, a tune written by a guy called Rouget de Lille for his friend, the mayor of Strasbourg in 1792. One of the possible precursor tunes that might have been in de Lille's head is Mozart's Piano Concerto number 25 in C major, K503 for you Mozart scholars, specifically the first movement, specifically the second subject, which, as we're going to play to you now, sounds like a minor key version of the major key tune of La Marseillaise. And hearing this, Jack's musical persona suddenly leaps into life. It's wonderful. Stephen, cried Jack, not another note, I beg. I have it exactly, if only it don't fly away. He whipped the cloth off his violin case, tuned roughly and swept straight into the true line. After a while, Stephen joined him. And when they were thoroughly satisfied, they stopped, tuned very exactly, passed the rosin to and fro, and so returned to the direct statement to variations upon it, inversions, embroideries, first one setting out in a flight of improvisation, while the other filled in, and then the other doing the same, playing on and on, until a lee lurch half-flung Stephen from his seat so that his cello gave a dismal screech. Oh, Mike, wonderful moment. This, This is the touchstone of their relationship and Jack's happiness, and they're playing again. And I'm really reading this as as Jack being in some kind of a happy place here. So you know, they've lost the rhythm, but Jack says it's just as well. You know, today he'd play the role of six midshipmen during the gunnery exercise, you know, doing what each of them would have done for their own set of guns. And, and he's exhausted. And Stephen stands to go to bed, but then lurches and Jack catches him, asking him where his sea legs are. Seems it's not a question of sea legs at all. The ship is moving about in a very wild, unbridled manner. A crocodile would file in such circumstances without it had wings. So Jack is thinking, you know, maybe the night's going to be dirtier than I thought. And he asked Killick to stow his fiddle, the doctor's cello, and the doctor's article in the bread room. Oh, and the Killick article. corrects him, right? It's the doctor's object. <laughs> Killick doesn't like article. You know, in Killick's mind, an article is like a chamber pot. But to Killick, this thing that Diana gave Stephen, this thing we've talked about many times, this, you know, kind of music stand wash basin, desk, medicine chest, bookcase, secret drawers and compartments, and all the other stuff, all surrounded with all these gold things that Killick can polish. That is like a holy object. And Killick takes idolatrous care of it, wrapping it in claws and three rough weather cases here. (sighs) And just as we're on this optimistic note, we do get a little reminder. Well, is it a reminder of Diana's love for Stephen, or is it a reminder of the pain that Stephen's in right now? Maybe a little bit of both. Right. Jack, though, we're going to close the chapter with Jack. He's standing in his cabin. His mind is running through his position, the currents, the wind forces, the changing barometric pressure, what he knows about the recent weather history in this part of the Atlantic, and he puts on a pilot jacket. He goes on deck. He checks that everything has been prepared for a blow and gives Davidge his orders to close reef the topsails when the larboard watch is called and to call him if there is any change in the wind. Back in the cabin, he observed, this may be the blow I was talking about when I have said that an action or a storm pulled a mixed crew together wonderfully. I wish I may not have spoken like a fool. I wish it may not have been thought I desired a really violent blow. And Stephen wraps up the chapter for us with a bit of wisdom once again. Yes, yeah, Stephen says, My godfather's great-great-grandmother lived in a villa, and in a house that I shall show you and Sophie when the war is done, she knew St. Teresa, and the saint told her that more tears were shed over prayers that were granted than ever were shed over prayers that were refused. End of chapter two. Oh. Ah. And that's a real quote? Yeah, a real quote from St. Teresa? Yeah. Well, it's certainly attributed to her. More tears are shed over answered prayers than over unanswered prayers. You know, we might anglicize it nowadays here. But again, attributed, I'm not sure, I, and I didn't look hard. I'm not sure it's in her writings, but certainly 
there are memes all over the internet, you know, <laughs> putting putting this as, as Saint Teresa, so it must be true, right? So, Mike, this has been a chapter with all kinds of visual symbols for us. We had all the, the blood and the gore in Moet's poetry. We had the splatter of the pudding when the digester exploded. We've had the blue Peter called back to mind. We've had the gunnery. We've had Padine and his hand and the laudanum. We've had all of this um, mystery and foreboding, but also hope. We've had Ray and Ledwood. We've got the prospect of the voyage to South America. There's a lot still to come in this book, I'm thinking. Well, Ian, I, I don't know. Like you say, there's a lot to come and so much going on. What do you say next week, Ian, to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. <laughs> playing again and i'm really reading this as as a jack being in some kind of a happy place here <laughs> Ooh, mosey agrees sorry let me go find out who's at the door here